Um, so as you can see uh, from our title, uh, our topic is uh, Hidden Idols. And uh, it's, it's kind of a strange topic for a discourse. Um, I'm sure everybody would agree, but we'd like to uh, hurry along and, and uh, start off by turning to Genesis uh, 31. Genesis 31. And uh, here we find a, a situation where uh, Jacob, let's see if I can get this down here now, even though there probably should be tents here, um, Jacob had uh, fled from Laban, as you remember, with many, many goods, uh, animals, and Laban's two daughters, uh, Leah and, uh, and Rachel. Uh, Laban feels slighted for uh, Jacob not telling him that he was leaving and demands to search for Laban's hidden idols. Now, Jacob doesn't know that Rachel stole her father's idols and hid them with some furniture that she was sitting on over her camel. Genesis 31, 26. Then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You've deceived me and you've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of timbrels and harps? You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night, the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you long to return to your father's household, but why did you steal my gods? So Jacob did not know that Rachel had some hidden idols. Neither did Laban who searched for the hidden idols. Now Jacob speaks. Genesis 31, 32. But if you find anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourself whether there is anything of yours here with me. And if so, take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Genesis uh, 31, 33. So Laban went unto Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he found nothing. After he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Verse 34. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them inside her camel's saddle and was sitting on them. Laban searched through everything in the tent, but found nothing. But unlike Rachel's father, who could not find any hidden idols, our father, our heavenly father, knows exactly where our hidden idols may be, even if we don't know ourselves. Then again, we may not really have any idols. That is what we wish to explore in this discourse. Do we have any hidden idols? But some of us may say, Brother Larry, I, I don't have any hidden idols. Well, perhaps you do and perhaps you don't. Perhaps the same for me. Perhaps it's in our definition and perception of what idols are. Some may be hidden from our view like they were from Laban. But the first step in getting rid of them is in the recognition of them. How many think of some stone or metal object of worship from a far eastern country like India or China? I know that's what I usually think of when I think of idols. Something like a Buddha or uh, an image of Confucius or possibly a Catholic statue or a patron saint. Millions of people across the world worship some stone, ceramic, or metal object representation of a god they have learned to venerate. What would your definition of idolatry be? If you go online, you might find this definition. Extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. Well, let me also give you Brother Russell's and see what you think, his definition. Listen carefully, dear friends. I think it's a good one. From reprint 2299. Idolatry, 
the inordinate or undue respect, homage, reverence, or devotion paid to any person, system, or thing. Merriam-Webster's dictionary says that idolatry is the worship of a physical object as a god or notice an immoderate attachment or devotion to something. Let's consider Abraham. To my understanding, Abraham, the father of the faithful, grew up with a father and a family that worshiped and served other gods. Abraham had made a real leap of faith to depart from his family's persuasion of image worship and conclude for himself that there was only one true God and that his God was invisible. We offer this scriptural support for his family's idolatry. Joshua 24, 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor. And notice, and they served other gods. Later in Bible history, we read that Moses had brought the nation of Israel out of the, an idolatrous nation like Egypt through a series of 10 miraculous plagues against Egypt. The culminating experience was when Israel was delivered from Pharaoh's revenge by God's divine power on their behalf, departing the Red Sea for their crossing. What incredible visual images appeared right before their eyes. Even after they had seen the power of divine providence many times, when Israel had come to Mount Sinai, they failed the test of patience and waiting on God. With Moses still up in the mount for weeks, they forced the hand of Aaron to succumb to building a golden calf to worship, which would represent God. They knew better, and so did Aaron but they all did something that we might find ourselves doing sometime in our Christian walk. Can you guess? Rationalizing. Rationalizing a wrong. Let's first take a look and see what the scripture actually said in reference to God's command against idol worship. Exodus 20, verses 2 to 5. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Brethren, I believe this is a trap that the adversary uses quite regularly with us. Beware of rationalization. When we wish to acquire, want, or do something badly enough, we try to find reasons that would justify such a course or decision. Soon, the want becomes a need. Probably many Israelites told Aaron that they needed to make an idol to represent God. However, it really wouldn't be disobeying his command because after all, God just said, he didn't want them to make any graven image, and they just wanted a mole made of a calf. Do we ever try to get technical with God to justify a desired course of action? Let's read a passage again from reprint 4022. The commandment said that they should make no likeness nor graven image to represent God. And what they did was only indirectly a breach of this, for the golden calf which Aaron made for them was not graven, 
not carved, but cast in a mold. And it did not represent God, but probably like the images they had seen in Egypt, was a nondescript thing which merely represented divine characteristics. A calf's body with a human head and with wings, symbolical of strength, of intelligence, omniscience. Again, reprint 4022. I recommend reading this article. Uh, it goes over to 4023. Like Israel's rationalizing, if we don't follow God's directions very carefully and we find ourselves skirting around the real issues to justify a wrong course, we too will find there are consequences to our poor choices. Nominal Christians today have been disposed to take too great of liberties and introduce their own conceptions of divine worship without sufficient care to hold to the exact instructions of the divine message. Statues of Mary and crucifixes of Christ dying on the cross are just some of the examples but even organizations can become an idol. People can inadvertently find themselves all wrapped up in organizations that they give their time, money, devotion, and adoration to on the altar of personal sacrifices for such organizations or systems. But why should we be concerned about the Decalogue and God's command about idolatry? Are we of the new creation under the law? No, according to the scriptures, we're not under the law, but rather under the spirit of the law. Romans 8, 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Then in Romans 6, 14, it clearly says, For sin shall, have, shall not have dominion over you. Now notice, ye are not under the law, but under grace. We believe the grace covenant, Romans 5.2 and Galatians 4.22-31. So, when we read passages like this one in 1 Corinthians 10.5, where it ties in Israel wanting to give their affections and devotions to self-gratifications and the worship of expensive idols they could see, immediate gratifications, for play and pleasure. We read in 1 Corinthians 10, 5, but, many with, but with many of them, God was not well pleased to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So be careful what we desire, and be careful that those things do not lead us to idolatry. We should learn to wait on the Lord, recognize his authorized agencies, like Moses, and his leadings, and mortify self-gratification, seeking God's will and direction in our lives, and not our own self, our own self-will and self-seeking interests. Always looking for our Father's eye of approval in all that we say and do and think. This comes through prayerful meditation and study, as well as looking for the subtle leadings of the Holy Spirit in our life and applications of the divine principles. Otherwise, negative consequences will surely result. Hebrews 12, 9 and 13. Later in Israel's history, after David had put down idolatry in his kingdom, his wise son Solomon had risen to the throne of authority. Solomon had demonstrated his wisdom many times on various occasions, like the situation between the two harlots, that both claimed to have had the same child. However, Solomon's great wisdom wasn't always so great. He made some pretty poor choices also which had devastating consequences for himself and for his kingdom. Let's all be guided, brethren, not by the bit and bridle, but rather by our Father's eye, our scriptural direction that should educate us to the right choices. 
there was trouble with surrounding nations. And Solomon wanted peace for the nation of Israel and for himself. He reasoned, if I take wives or royalty from these various nations, there would be peace somewhat between us. But did Solomon think this out carefully enough? Did he take it to the Lord in prayer frequently and consider the divine mind in the matter? What direction God would be pleased with him taking? Apparently not. The Lord had given him direction, but Solomon wasn't listening. 1 Kings 11, 2-4 As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David, his father, had been. The consequences were devastating and offended God deeply. Solomon followed Ashtoreth, Moloch, and Chemosh, which was evil in the sight of God, to appease his wives. Solomon's heart was not fully devoted to Jehovah. Is our heart fully devoted? Do we sometimes have selective listening to Jehovah's voice in some matters, hear what we want to hear, and don't truly seek out his direction in our choices? Choices that attract our time and affections and fleshly wants? Do we prayerfully reason things out, or do we just reason things out? Do we make compromises of sacrifice, time, and devotion? to fleshly wants, to often appease our relatives, our wives, our husbands, sons and daughters, finding ourselves rationalizing our actions. This is what God really wants to find out about us. Do we really seek out his will and not our own? That's the question. Colossians 3, 2, 3, 2 and 3. So now let's move into the gospel age. The system of nominal churchianity rose up during the gospel age to make similar mistakes as Israel did. Now, there are many wonderful Catholic people, good people in the world, but the great Catholic church system made literal idols of Mother Mary, St. Christopher, and patron saints, as well as thousands of crucifixes with our Lord Jesus' agony portrayed in statue. The leaders and laity probably rationalized that the congregations need to see some representation of these holy individuals for worship purposes. Sound familiar? Catholic friends believe that Jesus is God and the Pope is the vicar of God or represents himself as Christ on earth if they look carefully into their teachings. Throughout history, many Catholic popes have claimed to be divine. Even a 20-minute search on the computer will reveal the fact. So for many, the pope has become an idol. Revelation 17, 1 to 9, we refer. The Protestant system has also erected their idols with beautiful churches and ornate stained glass windows, popular gospel singers, and prideful displays of superior choirs that win vocal awards, as well as high-energy preachers that they look like and follow as American idols, where they seem to worship and pay tribute to the very ground they walk on. How very sad. I would say that the late Billy Graham and Joel Olstein might well fall into this category. But even Bible students over the past harvest period can make idols of talented, intelligent men, where some can worship the very ground these men walk on and give them too much adoration, devotion, and inordinate homage, sometimes to their spiritual detriment. The nominal churches worship their man-made creeds, like the Nicene Creed, and give their devotion to it just like true Christians should the Holy Bible. Some Christians have organized clubs like the 700 Club, and have given their heart allegiance to it and its leadership. Some give their allegiance to the World Council of Churches or other church man-made organizations, like the Jehovah's Witness organization. Remember the definition of idolatry? 
undue or inordinate respect, homage, or devotion to any person, any system, or anything. It's the immoderate or excessive attachment to someone or something, especially when you place it before or in place of God. Almost anything or anybody that you give your heart, your reverence, or devotion to more than you do God in his service can become an idol. And our flesh and the adversary are crouched at the door of our new minds attempting to rationalize anything it really wants in any shape, manner, or form that it can trap us into obtaining it and stumble us from our path to the plane of glory. But Brother Larry, how can I tell what my idols are? Well, Brother Russell had a good suggestion in this reprint 4023. As we have already pointed out, he says, some hearts have many idols, others a few, and it is not difficult to determine which idols a man worships. Now, listen carefully. The worship will be indicated by the sacrifice. Tell us the things to which a man or woman sacrifices his or her best thoughts, best time, chief influence, and we can tell you readily the idol which he reverences most and before which he has the largest altar and sacrifices most. There's the key to answering the question for all of us. Maybe I should repeat that again, but there's not enough time. So brethren, let's take a look at some of the world's idols and see if we cannot identify some hidden idols of our own because that which is prevalent in the world is often a special threat to the church. You know the old saying about we're like a ship on the ocean, right? Let's see if we need to plug up a few holes. What do you say? Some people really idolize popularity. Even 15 minutes of fame for some could mean sacrificing their time, their morals, their family, or even their life. How empty, how hollow is the embrace of the world's capricious arms? Today you're on top, like American Idol and Forbes magazine, and tomorrow you could just as easily be the target of the world's laughter, disdain, or be called a has-been by some. The world is a fickle and a superficial attainment of disillusioning expectations. Most people seem to want recognition only to flee to paths of disguised retreat after a good taste of what popularity can bring. But like we said, popularity and recognition could even be hidden, a hidden idol for some talented elders in the truth who may enjoy the recognition of many brethren and may look more for the praise of men than for the praise of Jehovah. Yes, the popularity for the chief seats amongst those they esteem could be a hidden idol for even our most talented, if not careful. Stiff warnings from our master in Luke 11:43 tell us this. Brethren, let all who are elders take heed and those who give misplaced adoration. We should never let respect morph into adoration or idolization of elders. Would you agree that money seems to be the God of this world? Although we actually know that Satan is, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the allurement of money is a chief tool in many of his satanic schemes. People appear to almost bow down and worship the golden calf or bronze bull of mammon given it daily homage and devotion, all of their heart's affections of sacrifice, time, and talents, and energy. Money is power, and money brings many attractive choices. More money, more choices. Money is the fuel for self-gratification of those who selfishly live for this present world's illusions of empty happiness. But the love of money is the root of all evil, right? The love of money. Having money is not wrong, but if you love it and give the best part of your mind and body to attaining it for selfish pursuits, that is wrong. 
for a true Christian. And that is to be sacrificed on the altar of sacrifice to the Lord. Psalms 50 verse 5. But many of the churches today tell their congregations that they can have it all. The prosperity gospel, you know. That God wants them to have money and all the wonderful things it can buy. And they can fully serve God as a Christian and at the same time have that too. But what did Jesus say about money? Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What does the Greek word mammon mean? Well, it's like wealth personified. The word of God tells us what happens when you love and worship money. Have you ever known anybody who fit into this scenario, worshiping money? I even imagine some Bible students have fallen into this trap of a hidden idol and not even recognized it. Again, it's all about choices, isn't it? Educating our mind to God's choices versus our human perceptions. Let's read that scripture referred to earlier in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I'm afraid it seems even some Bible students have demonstrated partiality over the years to those with money. If we are doing that, then we are not like Jesus, and we need to change. Money can be a hidden idol also, can The world puts a premium on a person's job position, don't they? But the question for many of us to answer is this, do we love our careers and are we giving more devotion to them than is really necessary? I could even do this when I was teaching science to fifth grade students, since I really enjoy teaching it so much. Perhaps there are other teachers in the audience that know what I'm talking about, right? There's no real end to the many lessons you could develop and teach for the, for the kids. Stealing time beyond what's necessary. Stealing time beyond what's necessary. But it's not just teachers, is it? Unfortunately, many have sacrificed their families on the altar of devotion to their jobs and their business pursuits only to regret it years later when looking back when it's too late to recapture the opportunities missed. Beautiful people can often be idolized or worshiped. You may recognize some here. George Clooney, Marilyn Monroe, people from the past that many of us identify with, Elvis Presley, Raquel Welch, and the list goes on and on. I'm sure there's uh, newer ones we could put up here. There are many very beautiful people in the world, aren't there? People have glorified and given inordinate amounts of affection and adoration to some of these people in our society. Certainly television and movies have credited and defined the culture of beauty, form and feature, worship and adoration. And some of these people are idolized by many. However, what is created in the perception of the mind is often a fleeting vapor of disappointment when the reality of cosmetics, true personality, and immorality is revealed in many. Virtual worship of handsome sports stars like maybe Tom Brady and lovely singers like perhaps Leanne Rimes or Taylor Swift can all be hidden idols in the hearts of some people. We should foremost and always worship the creator and not the created. Could that have been part of Adam's problem in the very beginning of human history? Could he have worshipped this beautiful woman that God had given him so much that he found himself worshipping her, who he could see, more than he worshipped his creator, who he could not see? Had Eve become a hidden idol to him, where he worshipped her beauty and for which he was willing to sacrifice even life itself? 1 Timothy 2.14 shows Adam knew he would die if he joined Eve in eating the forbidden fruit. Search your hearts carefully, dear friends, for any hidden idols. 
that you or I might have within. There are so many hidden idols we could have, dear friends. Could even our TV be an idol? What do you think? Could our TV be capturing an inordinate or excessive amount of our time, affections, or devotion? Or can we better regulate our time so we might have more time to engage in the study and meditation of God's holy word? I know I can do even better, a better job at that myself. I like to watch TV from time to time. How about you? Could you and I place a volume or such by the remote so it is just as easy to pick up the volume as it is the remote? Is the Lord clocking our hours? Might uh, we miss the boat of our heavenly reward because of excessive amounts of time that could have been applied more to listening to talks or filling our minds with a study of God's word, but we didn't have the self-control to press the off button more frequently? Change is never easy, but nothing changes unless something changes, right? So what are we going to change, dear friends? What are we going to change starting today? And finally, my brother, not in my words, but in the words of our beloved apostle, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Whereby, or wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Yes, the new creature is in a life and death struggle with the old creature for existence. It's a life or death tug of war struggle where we must, from the words of William Barclay, strain every nerve for what lies ahead, the prize of our calling. There are many, many more idols we could consider, as you can see here. Yes, dear friends, in conclusion, it's an everyday struggle where you cannot let go or take a break from the thoughts and foes that are pulling you in the opposite direction. It's a daily mental battlefield of spiritual courage that can only be won by determination, faith, and the strength from above. Because he that is for you is greater than he that is against you. Jesus said, he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Yes, those idols that Laban was looking for were hidden from him. But the Lord knew where they were. But unlike Rachel, let's make sure we don't have some hidden idols tucked away that will stumble us from our chief aim in life, namely to please and glorify our God, to do his will, not our own, and to follow holiness without which no man will see God. May we strive with even greater determination than ever, dear friends, to cleanse our minds with the sanctification of the truth and bring all of our heart's affections, our devotion, and zeal of sacrifice in the interest of the truth. Hot, fervent zeal is what the Lord is looking for in our devotion to him. While we strive to sweep out all the leaven out of our hearts throughout the year, searching and cleansing the crevices and cracks for sinful propensities of leaven, as we have just done in this past memorial season, let us search even more carefully, perhaps, for the hidden idols that might have slipped into some places that we overlooked completely. The bottom line is this. We must love God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. Hidden idols will always take up the space that pushes out the fervent zeal and devotion of a healthy consecration. Idols of any kind are dangerous, counterproductive, and seriously offensive to Jehovah and must be removed at any and all costs. But first, they must be objectively and prayerfully identified. Let us all look deeply into our true affections and devotion to carefully and prayerfully consider if we have anywhere in our lives any inordinate or undue respect, homage, reverence, or devotion for or of mental or physical energies I'll, I'll, that we pay to any person, any system, or anything that our God would be offended at or would diminish our relationship that we so greatly desire to have with him and his son, Christ Jesus. 
let us prayerfully find any, any hidden idols that, like Rachel, lurk under the saddlebags of our hearts and destroy them. You may wish to read this article in 4022 or follow a meditation on this subject and perhaps reprint 5297 as well. And finally, in the words of our dear Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Amen.